With the death of the headphone jack in phones, many people have just switched over fully to wireless options. But for those of us that want to be able to run either our favorite IEMs or full-size headphones wired on the go, we've been left with a bit of a challenge as to how to do that. Some people opt for dedicated digital audio players, other people will go for standalone battery-powered DAC and amp units, but perhaps the most convenient option is something like this. This is the Crinear Protocol Max, Crinical's first foray into the source gear market, and there's a number of reasons that this is a far better choice than what's already out there, so let's talk about it. The Protocol Max comes in an all-metal matte black chassis with a small window allowing you to see some of the internal circuitry. It's not as flashy looking as a luxury and precision dongle or as chunky as the Fio KA17, but I'd say both of these are good things. This looks sleek, it looks good without drawing attention to itself, and for a device that is likely to spend a lot of its life in your pocket, every millimeter shaved off the actual size is going to be quite welcome. It's a truly balanced device, offering 4.4mm Pentacon balance output and a 3.5mm single-ended output, with a USB-C input on the opposite side that provides both data and powers the device as well. It has playback controls and a gain switch, volume though is controlled by your phone itself. It's a thorough but inexcessive design, and personally I'm a fan of that. It looks good, it's got everything I need, it's compact, and it feels good to the touch as well. But if you're looking for a dongle, and you're not sure which dongle you'd like to touch most, Headphones.com has a 365 day return policy, so you don't need to worry about a dongle being too big to fit or too small and unsatisfying. If you don't like something, you can just return it up to a full year later and get the one that's just right for you. Now the Protocol Max comes in. Sorry. Now the Protocol Max comes in at just under $100, so the price point itself is pretty attractive as well, especially once you start to look at some of the specs and performance aspects and how much you'd usually have to pay to match them. Just in terms of power alone, I was able to get about 500 milliwatts out of the Protocol Max at 32 ohm, which is substantially more powerful than competitors like the Fio KA17. This without an external power supply gets about 140 milliwatts, and in fact, this is still more powerful than some standalone battery powered units. The Cord Mojo 2 and Hugo 2 get 400 and 460 milliwatts respectively, so this is still more powerful than both of those as well. Now it should be noted that that was tested on an Android device, and if you're on an iPhone you may not get the exact same power output because iPhones actually limit how much current their USB ports can supply. So this is a USB powered device, if you're on a device that limits how much power it can provide through the USB port then yeah, you might not get the same level of power output, but that's nothing to do with the Protocol Max itself. Itself, that is just an Apple slash iPhone limitation, unfortunately. Now, one might worry that if this is a pretty powerful device, maybe some sacrifices had to be made in terms of noise or distortion in order to achieve that power output. But looking at the measurements, it seems like that's not really the case. The Protocol Max can output up to 4 volts into a high impedance load and gets 0.00015% distortion whilst doing so. And even when you turn it way down for use with sensitive IEMs, at 50 millivolts output, you're getting about minus 90 dB total harmonic distortion and noise, which for reference is about 7 dB better than the Cord Mojo 2, and is only 3 to 5 dB behind the absolute lowest noise IEM sources in the desktop category that are available. This will drive IEMs with absolutely no audible noise floor and has enough juice to run not just dynamic driver headphones, but some pretty power hungry planar magnetic headphones as well. Besides a Ralemanis or a Modhouse Tungsten, which for that headphone you need about 20 volts ideally, you're going to be able to run just about any headphones on this. The output impedance on the balanced output is just over half an ohm, just over a quarter of an ohm on single-ended, so if you've got extraordinarily low impedance IEMs, you might get a very slight change in frequency response. The lower the ratio of output impedance of your source to the impedance of the headphones are generally the more change in frequency response you're going to see, but half an ohm is still extremely low and for any headphone that is more than 10 ohms, you're not going to get any meaningful change whatsoever. So it's cheap, it's powerful, it's built nicely, it's low distortion, but there is one other feature that I think is going to appeal to a lot of people, which is that it's got a 10-band parametric equalizer. EQ is something I'm always very happy to see in source gear because EQ is the biggest upgrade you can make to just about any headphone system. Though, I do have some slight gripes with the implementation here. The EQ is configured using the Hangout.audio graph tool, which has the benefit that you can see the predicted change of your EQ on the frequency response of any headphone in Crinical's more than extensive measurement database. But the UI is a bit clunky to use. It doesn't have any sliders or constant preview or anything, so you just have to type values in and then see what it does. It's a bit more of a hassle and feels a little bit worse to use than either something like USB Audio Player Pro's EQ plugin on my phone, or as an example of another web-based configurator, the JDS Element 4. 
It would be nice if there were some sliders, a constant preview, maybe showing the bands and stuff, just to make it a little bit easier. This is great if you want to just apply auto EQ, but for manual EQs, I found it a little bit tricky to use. And the second issue is that you can't actually configure this on a mobile device. It seems like you have to use a desktop PC to change the EQ on this, so that means that once you've left home having set up the EQ for a particular headphone, if you either want to turn the EQ off, swap to a different headphone, make any changes at all, you have to hook it up back to a PC again, which is a little bit of a faff. So that, as a mobile portable focused device, does diminish the utility of this feature somewhat, but it's a software issue and one that could hopefully be improved either with the release of a companion app at some point or just a change to the website that allows you to configure it with a mobile device, not just desktop. So whilst I'm very glad that it has this feature, I found myself just going back to using the EQ plugin in USB Audio Player Pro, or if I was at my desktop, then just using Rune. The Hangout.audio website is great if you want to do auto EQ, though there are some slight issues with this approach. I would strongly recommend going and watching Resolve's video here, talking about why Learning to EQ yourself is going to give way better results than what auto EQ could ever give you, simply for the reason that the headphones are not going to behave the same way on your head as they behave on a particular measurement rig, and um, auto EQ can't account for that. If you'd like to see full measurements of the Protocol Max, they are available at the audio files section of headphones.com, linked in the description. Objectively, this is a pretty great performer. The overall distortion and noise are very low. It doesn't start rising in distortion once you start to crank it to higher output levels as well, like some DAX and amps do, so you know that it's going to behave pretty much the same no matter what you're running or what volume level you're listening at. The only slightly two weird things are, firstly, as you can see on the linearity graph, it actually lowers the level of content above about minus 30 dB by around a third to a fourth of a decibel. That's something which is common with Cirrus stack chips. I'm not really sure why, but it also happens on the Luxury and Precision dongle, which is also using a Cirrus DAC chip. So that just seems to be a Cirrus thing. Actually, another Cirrus thing, and the second slightly weird thing, is there is quite a lot of ultrasonic noise. This would be more of a concern if you're wanting to use this just standalone as a DAC for an external amplifier, as whilst it's not directly audible, we can't hear at 100 plus kilohertz. High levels of ultrasonic noise can potentially influence the performance of a amplifier downstream, but if you're just using this to run headphones directly, it's nothing to worry about at all. So how does it sound? Well, overall, this is what I'd describe as a competent, neutral, no-frills device. The general sound signature is very close to what I would call transparent, and for the most part, it sounded just like it was getting out of the way and doing its job. When I was using this as a standalone DAC to drive an external amplifier, I did notice that there was a little bit of a softening aspect to certain transient elements. Brickwalled songs in particular had more of an obvious effect because there is a very slight sort of compression effect going on, as we saw in the linear graph earlier, but that only takes effect when you're using this at full tilt as a dedicated DAC. If you're driving headphones directly on this, where you've got it turned down below maximum, that effect doesn't kick in, and so when I was just running IEMs or most headphones on this, I didn't notice that at all. I was pleasantly surprised not only how good this sounded with sensitive IEMs, not just because it's got very high dynamic range, low noise, so there's no noise floor whatsoever, but also with power hungry stuff. This is one of the few dongles that I actually enjoyed the Hypermensis Vara on. If you wanted to run a Modhouse Tungsten or something, you're going to need a little bit more juice because that needs 20 volts or something absurd. It's a very difficult headphone, but everything else I tried sounded great on this, and I did not feel like they were being limited at all. In terms of pairings of headphones and IEMs for this, I did not really feel like it was picky, either in terms of driving capability or in synergy with the sound signature because, again, this just sounds pretty damn transparent. The level of detail retrieval and perceived resolution on the Protocol Max was just as good, maybe even slightly better, than the FIO KA17, which is also slightly more expensive. The Protocol Max tracks like BT's time moves so fast, the low end was tight, well controlled, and the treble was fast and open without being etchy or glary, whereas this leaned towards a little bit more of a clinical sound. The main area where the Protocol Max fell behind the Fiok A17 at times was in really, really busy tracks. Pain by The War on Drugs is a song that I use to test this kind of stuff a lot. It's got a lot going on, and it was just a little bit harder to pick out and focus on one particular element in the music on the Protocol Max compared to the Fiok A17. Though, incidentally, I did also get this on the Luxury and Precision W2131, which is also using a Cirrus chip and objectively shares a lot of behaviors in common with the Protocol Max, so I think that's more just a Cirrus DAC thing than anything to do with the product specifically. I have found that Cirrus chips do behave more noticeably different to AKM and ESS chips, or than AKM and ESS chips do to each other in most cases. And 
that comes with some good things as well. The ESS mobile variants, the Q2M chips, I have found that those products in particular have much more of a tendency to lean towards a slightly more fatiguing clinical signature than a lot of AKM chips or Cirrus chips do, and that's the case here. This is a lot more pleasant and easy to listen to than this for long periods of time. This, at times I felt like it was better at separating things, but it was also just a little bit more artificial sounding, whereas this was just a little bit more natural, even if less technically impressive for really busy tracks. That helps with timbre as well. Vocals on this sounded fantastic. Rich when needed, but not at all lacking clarity, and unlike the KA-17, never feeling like they were forcing detail for a more impressive, albeit artificial sound. Sound. This was just much more enjoyable to listen to for most genres of music. The only time I'd say I really preferred the KA-17 was on exclusively electronic tracks where this was just a little bit more incisive and everything synthetic anyway. When using this to run my headphones, this just sounds like it's for the most part getting out of the way and just doing the job of a transparent source, which is exactly what I'd want. Can you get an upgrade by spending a bit more money? Yes, the Chord Mojo 2 is a little bit more detailed. The Quest LCMA 18P stages a bit better and has a bit more power. And if you're really wanting to throw some cash at your source, the Astel and Kern SP4000 is an upgrade in pretty much every aspect, but for under $100, or even a price point a fair bit higher than that, this is a great sounding and objectively very well performing device, and one that I can wholeheartedly recommend. In fact, this is probably going to be the source that I take to shows from now on because it just works. The one thing that I would like to see improved with this is just an improvement to the configuration of the EQ. Having a 10-band EQ is fantastic, that's a great feature, but only being able to configure it on desktop and the UI being a bit clunky if you're not just wanting to directly apply an auto EQ preset is a bit of a shame. But it's not even a software issue, it's a website issue, so that could easily be fixed with a later update. As a DAC and amp, as a portable source, this is objectively great, subjectively great, at a price point that's hard to argue with. Critical's done a fantastic job with this. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've got any questions you wanted to ask about the Protocol Max, any kind of DAC, amp, source, headphones, gear, music, or anything else at all, come and say hey on the headphones.com Discord server or the headphones.com forum where I and other wiggly air enthusiasts will endeavor to help. Until next time, I'm Golden Sound, you're watching the Headphone Show by headphones.com, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.